uh, why is this region, as we call it as MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, widely known as MENA, is in turmoil always, most of the time. I have spent like more than a decade in that region and has, uh, and I've had the privilege of really understanding that, going through uh, that region, its story, its history for some time now. But let me start with, with one story, uh, an incident which happened, and that probably we will take off uh, and bring, a, bring a very clearly as to exactly what was the sentiment that prevailed during this, especially the last four years in that region. I still remember that date. It was October 20, 2011, early morning. And uh, me and my team, my photographer, my translator, my driver, and uh, my uh, video cameraman, we had just got up early in the morning. We hadn't spent really a good night of sleep or anything. We were in some desert uh, inside Surth, Libya. And it was early morning, and so suddenly we started hearing rumors that uh, there is a big attack and big bombing happening. And uh, so we, we, ran, we, we took our car and we drove towards the, uh, from where the sound was coming, the noise and the whole. And, we, and then suddenly we had this big group of rebels who were fighting uh, Mr. Muammar Gaddafi at that time. They stopped us. And that's when the first rumors started that Gaddafi has been captured, Gaddafi has been captured. A few minutes later, there was a group of rebels who came running towards her, completely happy, jubilant, joy, dancing and sh running with us and saying, Al Hindi, Al Hindi. They had, by now they had given me a name called Al Hindi because I was staying with them for months before, you know, as they went on fighting Gaddafi's forces, we were moving from one town to another town and I was staying with them. So for them, I was Al Hindi by then. So they came running to me and showing a mobile, uh, f showing me their mobile and on the mobile was the first uh, graphic video of uh, Mr. Muammar Gaddafi's dead body. And that was the first confirmation that he was captured, not only captured, but he was killed. What struck me at that time was that extreme joy on their face. They were jubilant that what the, you know, the head of the state was killed. That was, to me, that was the biggest event of 2011 Arab Spring uprising. Yes, before him we had Mr. Mubarak stepping down and toppled. We had uh, Zina Ben Ali uh, leaving in 2010, December itself, uh, leaving Tunisia, where the whole Arab Spring started. Uh, we had Ali Abdullah Saleh in Yemen negotiating his stepping down. And uprising had started in Syria against Mr. Bashar Assad. And at the same time, it was happening in Libya. But killing of Mr. Gaddafi was the highlight of that year, 2011 Arab Spring. What happened? Why were his own people suddenly overnight took arms and went against him? What was it? And who were these people? These people were people like you and me, doctors, uh, engineers, plumbers, mechanics, you know, lawyers, traders, garment shop owners. Practically everybody had armed themselves overnight and started fighting his forces and loyalists. And things just went out of control. Before we could realize what happened, things just went out of control and it was a full-fledged rebellion. The point was that they all were basically, they just wanted to get him out. The entire Arab Spring had spread like wildfire across this region. And Mr. Gaddafi's debacle was just probably waiting to happen. And he was probably the biggest fall of the Arab Spring at that time. Before that, as I said, we had Mr. Mubarak. 18 days of popular uprising, starting from uh, end of almost end of Jan till February 11, 2011, he stepped down. 18 days iconic Tahrir Square of Cairo was absolutely thunderous, just like millions were there. Nobody had seen something like that uh, in the Middle East for, for decades. You know, nothing like that had ever happened. And you see these millions of people uh, continuously asking for three basic rights, freedom, uh, bread, social dignity, democracy. Why was that happening? Same thing, we saw an armed rebellion in Syria. Suddenly, just like Libya, overnight, people are taking arms and fighting Mr. Bashar Assad because the Assad family has been ruling uh, Syria for decades. It was Bashar Assad and before that his father. They wanted a change. The point is there is, there is that, that entire region is just was waiting for something like this to happen. One feels now, if you look at, if you go by hindsight and look back as to how the events unfolded, it is a region which largely, especially these countries, it, it's a country which has largely been run by security apparatus. People are tired of excessive use of security apparatus, especially Egypt, 
where I'm currently based. It is uh, like a lot of experts call it that even if the revolution happens, the deep state is still there. And by deep state, they call about uh, security apparatus, the police, the armed forces who have been ruling Egypt for the last, uh, since, uh, since 1952, the toppling of the monarchy. All the presidents of Egypt have been uh, army officers, except Mr. Morsi, who was democratically elected, Egypt's first civilian president, who, as you said, was from the Brotherhood. Now, the Brotherhood itself, which was formed in 1928 as a grassroots organization, as a movement, has denounced violence many years ago. So it is not directly involved or indirectly involved in any kind of violent activity that is happening reportedly. That's what we understand. The point is still, it has its uh, grassroots operations going on. It, it runs one of the best uh, movement that is uh, probably uh, in the Middle East or in, in the entire Islamic world for that matter. Uh, it has its own clinic uh, network, education institutions, departmental stores. It is meeting the people straight away directly. It was virtually running a parallel uh, system to the government. In fact, people tell us in Egypt that Brotherhood gives us much more better facilities in a hospital rather than a government hospital. Now, all this thing was happening and building up at the same time when Mubarak was there. I'm slightly going to, uh, to Egypt now since I'm there. And it was there, and this kind of a parallel setup was building up in Egypt. And it was just a time, a trigger which was required, and that trigger came through the Arab Spring. Though it started in Tunisia, the biggest events took place in Egypt and Libya and Syria. Now, the bottom line was that people were essentially tired of watching the same people ruling for decades. Mr. Mubarak was for more than 30 years, 32 years, and the trigger for Mubarak was not just that he was ruling for so many years. It was also the a track record of corruption. People were just tired of continuous corrupt movements, corrupt governments, scandals sitting one after the other, and uh, extreme privilege enjoyed by a select group of people, while millions were literally fighting for jobs, poverty was rising, unemployment was rising. It's one of the youngest countries in the Middle East. In fact, the whole region probably is, is one of the youngest. You know, Most of the population is young, below 30 or, 30 or in the 30s. So this frustration was building up. And as I said, you have a deep state security apparatus ruling virtually your life day in and day out. But another trigger which literally uh, tri uh, made the whole Mubarak stepping down went was the plan to probably bring his son as a future president. And that's when people really said that you just can't have that again and again. You just can't have the same family ruling for uh, for Egypt, ruling Egypt for such a long time. And that really set them off and they started coming down. It was one of the most democratic uprising you could see. Civilians coming down on the streets, civilians coming down on every street, corner, nook and corner of Cairo, uh, Alexandria, Luxor, so were like completely uh, full of people who wanted Mubarak out. Finally, he had to step down. Interestingly, what happened after that was you had Egypt's first, historically first elected civilian president, Mr. Morsi, and that was really a kind of a symbol that things can happen in this part of the Muslim world, that you can have a democratically elected government, a democratically elected president who people have elected properly through a proper channel of democratic system of elections which uh, our country and the Western world is so familiar with. And there was a kind of a euphoria and there was this feeling that yes, we have uh, Arab Spring is really something. Finally, things, is, things are happening in the Arab world. Unfortunately, it lasted just for a year. Within months, Mr. Morsi made some mistakes. People started feeling that he is becoming president only of the Muslim Brotherhood and not of the entire Egypt which he had promised. And that perception grew day by day. And let's not forget, Egypt was still in that momentum of uprising. To me, Egypt has gone through three uprisings. The first, against Mubarak in 2011. Second, immediately after the military a command which took power uh, after Mubarak stepping down and before Mr. Morsi came. So people revolted even against them. And third was Mr. Morsi. And within six months of Morsi's uh, presidency, uh, millions started coming on the streets. And finally, uh, on June 30, when there were at least 30 to 35 lakhs, like three, three to four million people and Tahrir again, demanding his resignation, that was the time when his defense minister and now president, uh, Mr. Sisi, decided that, you know, 
he needs to go and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Morsi was removed from power. That was a setback to the whole Arab Spring. The interesting part here is that it came on the back of a popular uprising. People wanted him out. The same people who elected him wanted him out. So international media, international experts are still trying to understand what exactly was it. Was it really a coup? Was it really uh, uh, a military general moving and removing him out because of, uh, of popular support? It's open to debate. The, the fact is that Egypt's first elected president, one of the biggest achievements of Arab Spring, was removed from power within a year. And that was the first setback to the Arab Spring in the true sense of democratic, as we know, democracy. After that, we saw a lot of international reaction to that, especially Washington, uh, which gives annual aid to Egypt since decades of $1.5 billion, froze that aid, uh, didn't give it until just probably two months ago when they released most of their aid again, when things started improving relations with the new government which has been installed by Mr. Sisi, things started improving. But that was the way Washington reacted immediately, you know, because uh, a democratic elected president was removed for power and that didn't go down uh, well. But even more than that, what really happened, and to me that's how probably Arab Spring is already dying, is an incident which happened immediately after Mr. Morsi's removal of power, from power, and that is uh, August 14th, 2013, last year, just a month after a month, a month and a half after Mr. Morsi was removed, we had a big assault on civilian protesters. All the Brotherhood protesters and sub supporters who were supporting Mr. Morsi were on the streets demanding him to be brought back. Now, that protests, those protests went on for like weeks. People were on streets, they refused to go. Now, these were Mr. Morsi's supporters. They refused to go. Finally, General Sisi and the new government which he had installed decided that we need to break this protest. And one day on August 14 in the morning, like around 7, 7, 38 o'clock, uh, you had elite police force storming these squares and dispersing these protests. In, the, in that entire day from morning 8 till evening 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock, you had around 1,000 people killed in straight in the police assault on these two uh, squares. Now that, to me, is a watershed incident. It is, as uh, Human Rights Watch, uh, recognized, esteemed uh, international human rights body, says it is the single biggest killing of demonstrators in modern world history, probably after Tiananmen Square. And that was an incident which to me, sealed or ensured probably the death of Arab Spring in itself. Uh, because you had a democratic elected president out, you had his supporters killed, and now you have General Sisi, who is now the president. So the questions which people ask is, are, is Egypt back to square one? Is Arab Spring uh, really still on? Seems to be no, because you have uh, uprising still on in Syria. Libya, which we all know as we speak right now, is going through probably one of its worst phases because there is a clash between various rebel groups who have turned into militias after the killing of Mr. Gaddafi. Each one is fighting for their own. It's like a, a country of warlords now. Each one is fighting for its own territory, for his own territory and his own uh, strategic interests. So that country which we saw a biggest uh, uprising going down, uh, Yemen is still trying to kind of uh, recover from uh, Mr. Saleh's uh, going and the new government coming into power. Egypt going through its own turmoil. All this thing basically happened because of the, and not just about uh, need for democracy. It's also about where exactly these young people want to go. It's a search for an identity, end of the day. It is search for, for how they want to build their own individual countries in the future. This, this young population today is exposed to all the modern technologies, whether it is social media, whether it is social networks, whether it is modern uh, uh, television media, uh, international exposure to international developed countries, whether it is the West, Asia, uh, or Europe. All these people, are, and they want a life which is similar to them. The only interesting thing or the glaring thing which you mentioned, Mrs. Ond, is that how this whole radical Islam suddenly comes into that. 
That is something which people are still trying to understand. Because what happened is that suddenly in Syria, you started groups coming and fighting under the name of Islam. When the movement initially was Arab Spring, it was a democratic movement, but you had these groups coming in, militant groups coming in, literally hijacking the entire rebellion, which people started, which people started initially. You had the same thing happening now in Libya. You have armed groups coming in. And a country which is extremely close to me and where I have spent some of my best moments, Iraq. It is literally getting ruined, and you have this new group emerging, ISIS. We had never heard of this group two years ago. Yes, for the last two decades, at least since 9-11, everybody knows about Al-Qaeda, uh, which has propagated radical Wahhabi uh, Islam. But now we have a group called ISIS, or IS as they now call Islamic State itself. It's coming up emerging rapidly, and last week's killing of James Foley has virtually sent shivers down everybody. Like, what exactly is this group? Who are these people? What are they doing? And where did this come? I think it is all about polarization. Increasingly, we are having groups uh, believing that you know you have to be stick together. Uh, Arab Springs experience in Egypt, the crushing of brotherhood, has also signaled that can you really have democracy? Can you believe authorities that you can have a democratic government? Because the questions which some of the youngsters who are getting radicalized, let's say in Egypt or in Syria and Libya, are asking is that hey, what happened? You got in Egypt a democratically elected president. He was removed in one year. So what are you talking about democracy? Is this the way to really be in power? No, maybe violence is the way. Because having an elected president peacefully didn't serve the purpose. He didn't get his four years to do. Why should we believe in genuine, peaceful democracy? Maybe. This is the only way to get power and stick to power. And that's why you are having increasingly small groups uh, building in Egypt, Sinai, or uh, even in mainland Egypt. And of course, we know in ISIS in, in Iraq, or uh, Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria, these are propagating. These are the groups which are attracting youngsters. And ISIS increasingly is attracting youngsters. And as I have always been saying since I came here, and even yesterday, I had a privilege to be with Sudhin again in a different talk with ORF, is that the strategy here of ISIS is to capture territory and retain it. It doesn't believe just in uh, suicide bombings or car bombings. It is believing in retaining territory, capturing territory and retaining. It is operating like a proper military on the battlefield. The new leader which it has, which is uh, Abu Bakr Baghdadi, he is completely emerging as probably the new emerging face of uh, uh, Islamic militancy. You know, we, we had uh, Osama bin Laden, who was uh, killed uh, a few years ago. And then Mr. Zawahiri took over. But probably there is this new group now with a new leadership, extremely charismatic leadership under Baghdadi, who believes that battlefield is the way, capturing territory is the way, and retaining it. And the point is, which I keep repeating uh, in various uh, uh, talks, is that the more he retains territory, the more IS retains territory, the more it becomes attractive for young, radicalized, frustrated youths to join them. And uh, facts on the ground and reports which are emerging more and more are showing that youngsters from many countries, not just uh, Middle East countries or the Muslim countries or Islamic countries, but even Europe, West, and even Asia, are, uh, reports are coming that they are joining IS. To me, the reason is, uh, this, this particular strategy which uh, Baghdadi is implementing, and that is capture, retain. So you can establish your rule. And that rule to us, what we have seen pictures, I haven't been to Iraq in the last, uh, for the last few years since I left, but whatever my colleagues and send, me, uh, send reports is that, like a city like Mosul, which they captured. Today there is a completely different situation in various parts of Mosul of Iraq. Like today there is no music playing, music is banned, cinemas are banned, Women, as you said, Mr. Sound, women are completely uh, dressed uh, in hijab, naqab, which was not the case in Iraq a few years ago, even under Saddam. It was never. Even under Mr. Maliki, who stepped down last week, was not like this. So what is happening? So to me, it is that is the thing. Radicalized polarization, sticking together and fighting for self-identity and taking on. It's a clash. As we know, historically, it's a clash of ideologies. But right now, it is this group probably is a group to watch. And this is a group which has completely given new dynamics new dimensions to uh, Islamic militancy. And that is uh, the future threat uh, for uh, not just Middle East peace, but probably even global peace. And because of that, we may see a lot of new alliances on the ground, uh, old alliances breaking, new alliances occurring, 
uh, for former enemies and foes probably joining hands to take on this big uh, group called ISIS. And we just have to wait and watch how, how it unfolds, how the situation unfolds over the next uh, few months and years. Uh, I would like to stop here, but we are open for questions. And maybe the next speaker like to, so that we can keep it short. And if questions come, we can address them much more easily. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thanks to be here.